All right. Hey, I thought the kids did a fantastic job, didn't you? I don't want to. I don't want to take away their reward in heaven, but I thought they did really well. And I know I'm not super 100% objective, but they're not all mine. The tall ones are not mine, the rest of them. You guys are dismissed, though. The good, that's the good news today is that uh, Pastor Chris is taking you out for youth group. And then elementary kids, you guys have children's ministry as well. And everybody else, we are in for a treat this morning. What a fantastic chapter. It's, one, it's a great one in the book of Revelation. So turn to Revelation chapter 7. Um, you know, as you're turning there, I'll just remind you, you know, last week when we looked at chapter 6 of the Revelation... We spent some time looking as well at a very familiar, what's called the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And in many ways, we said that that prophecy is what kind of provides us, if you will, with a, a backbone for Bible prophecy. We noted that 69 of those 70 weeks or those seven-year periods is what they're called, they've been completed. They were completed with the death of Jesus, leaving just one week, one seven-year period yet to be fulfilled. And we saw and we said that the scriptures predict that this final seven-year period will begin with a new and a coming world leader, right? The Antichrist, as he will come on the scene and broker a peace pact with Israel. And of course, how timely these kinds of prophecies are for us even right now. And so that's going to be what kicks off this period called the tribulation. It's going to be the completion of that 490 years of prophetic time. And it's going to include really what's going to conclude God's current plan for this planet. And we looked then in our text at chapter 6, what we call the loosing of the seven sealed scrolls. We looked at those sealed judgments. There were those judgments which, which we believe are going to occur during the first three and a half years of that seven-year tribulation period, likely starting immediately after the rapture of the church. The first seal, as we said, the first rider on that white horse is the Antichrist. He's going to rise to power. He's going to be the false Christ, which is going to be, you know, uh, the, the future world ruler. And we saw from our text that he's going to begin his conquest very peacefully. He's going to come claiming to be the solution to the increasing problems that the world is facing. And he's with him a peace, but it's going to be a false peace. And it's going to lead very quickly to that second seal, the red horse of war and conflict. The Antichrist, we said, is going to exchange his arrowless bow, remember, for a great sword. And we're going to see people beginning to kill each other, you know, violence all over the place, creating even more of what we see in the third seal, the black horse, which is famine. And it's a famine, it's a scarcity, it's an inequity, which so often is the inevitable aftermath of war. And according to the text, we're going to see the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer and unable to provide even for their daily needs. And of course, that's going to produce what we see in the fourth seal, which was the pale horse of death. Right? We see that fully one quarter of the world's population is going to be killed through these judgments, through war and through scarcity, disease, even wild beasts, it said, were going to contribute to that. Then we took a little bit of a pause. We saw the fifth seal, right, the martyrs. As John gets a, another v vision of heaven, if you will, he sees the, soul of the, mar the souls of the martyrs, it says, under that heavenly altar. And those were picturing all of those who are going to be killed because they're going to come to faith during that terrible time. And then finally, the sixth seal was kind of uh, this cosmic chaos that we're going to experience on earth, right? The earthquakes and the catastrophes and all of the upheaval that we're going to see. So chapter six gave us a pretty detailed description of what we call the wrath of the Lamb. Right? It's this period just to, as judgment is beginning to be poured out on the world. And remember in the closing verse of chapter 6, all of those who suddenly find themselves under this wrath, in verse 17 they cried out that the great day of his wrath 
has come. And then they asked a critical question. They asked, who is able to stand? Right? Who's able to continue to stand up under this intense judgment that's coming? And we talked for just a moment as we closed about the fact that this is a critically important question for all of us to answer. And we did answer it, though, kind of quickly as our time was running out. But I think what we're going to see this morning as we continue on in our text is that in the mind of God, this question is so important to all of us that I believe the Holy Spirit here in chapter 7 stops the action of the book in order not only to answer that question for us, but really to explain it to us in a couple of different ways. And as we look now into chapter 7, we're going to see those who are going to be saved in the midst of the great tribulation, those who will be able to stand under this great judgment. And we're going to see that there are two separate groups of redeemed people. But what I truly believe we're going to see as well, not only are we going to find out who's going to be saved during the tribulation, but in addition, I think we're really going to see that these groups, which we're going to see here pictured in heaven, they offer some wonderful encouragement and some very important application for our own lives as Christians, even now here. So let's pray and just really ask the Lord that he would bless and uh, give us understanding uh, this morning. So Father, we thank you again for your word, and we thank you for the privilege of studying it, Lord. We thank you for the way that you illuminate truth to us, Lord. We do pray for the teaching ministry of your spirit to be really manifest here today, Lord, and we pray uh, Lord, as we do each and every week, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to speak to each one of us as your church, Lord, individually, and then as well, just speak to your whole church corporately. And so we pray your blessing on this time, Lord, as you bless your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So as we pick up in our text, I need to point out just a kind of a structural feature of the book of Revelation. We think we maybe already mentioned it, but in the book of Revelation, things tend to happen in groups of seven, right? We're almost through the seven seals of the scroll, and the seventh seal of the scroll is what introduces the next set of seven trumpet judgments, and then it's the seventh trumpet judgment that then introduces the final set of seven bowl judgments, or the bowls of wrath. And yet what we see is that between the sixth and the seventh of each of these sets, we see that there's always a sort of a parenthesis, right? There's a brief break kind of in the action where we're provided with some detailed information, kind of a, a closer look at some specific subjects. Now, this type of sort of literary arrangement, this would have been very easily understood by the Jewish mind of the first century, right? This very newly Christian audience. Granted, it's a bit different for us. So between the sixth and the seventh seals, we're going to be introduced this morning to two special groups of people. Between the sixth and seventh trumpets, we're going to see John eat a book. We're going to see him measure the temple. We're going to be introduced to what are called the two witnesses. Now, between the sixth and seventh bowls, we're going to see some details about the unclean spirits that are really going to be what prompt that final batter, battle of Armageddon. And kind of structural parentheses, that's what makes a strict chronological summary of the book of Revelation a little bit challenging. It's what sometimes makes the book of Revelation a little bit harder to follow unless we start out understanding what the format is. And so today, as the book unfolds, we know that the great day of God's wrath is about to come, and so God brings kind of a calm in the storm, if you will, and extends his mercy first to his covenant people. Look what it says in verse 1. John writes that after these things, right, so after the first set of the first six seal judgments, 
John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Now imagine just for a moment what this would feel like here on this planet. Suddenly there is no wind, none at all. No wind from the north or from the south or from the east or from the west, right? From the four corners, there's no trade winds blowing, no summer breeze. There's no offshore flow, right, that air conditions us over here. There's no movement whatsoever at all in the entire atmosphere. And all of a sudden, there's just this dead, eerie calm that's going to fall all across the entire earth. And then it says in verse 2, John writes that I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, in Bible typology, the four winds very often speak of God's judgment or of something that's remarkable or unusual or of a, a devastating event. And here we've seen that these seals on earth have been opened. Now it's suddenly eerily quiet. And these winds now have held back the judgments just for a moment. Right? The judgments are being held back. Notice specifically it says on the earth and on the sea and on the trees, right? Or green vegetation. And most likely we're going to see these four angels that are holding back the four winds are the very same angels that we're going to see blow the first four trumpets of the trumpet judgments because those judgments are very strikingly similar. So we've got these four angels holding back the winds, and then it says there's another angel from the east who says holds the seal of God to seal the servants of God before the judgment of God. And so here we're going to see our first group of those who are going to be able to stand, and it's the sealed Jews. Now specifically, scripturally, a seal signifies both possession and protection. In Ezekiel chapter 9, we see this very same picture. We see that God's servant, Ezekiel, is seen putting a mark on the foreheads of the faithful so that they would be spared in the coming destruction of Jerusalem that was about to happen as Babylon would put the city under siege in 586 BC. And what's really interesting there in the Ezekiel text is that the seal that he was told to use in the original language, it's the Hebrew letter tau, or T, and it just happens to be in the shape of a small cross. It was the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It was what the Hebrews considered to be the sign of God. And I'm sure this is all probably purely a coincidence, right? Or it's not a coincidence whatsoever. Right here, they were sealed by the cross. They were to be spared from judgment. It's a beautiful picture there in the book of Ezekiel. But back to Revelation. So the sense here, right, is we have this sealing angel commanding the other angels to hold back the judgment until the servants of God have been similarly, similarly sealed. That's easy for me to say, right? They've been protected from the judgments that are to come. And John says in verse 4 that I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So these sealed servants, we learn here, are all Jews. And we're gonna see next that there's 12,000 from, as it says here, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. It's a very interesting and an intriguing picture and it's caused quite a bit of confusion throughout church history. Throughout the history of the church, there have been a number of groups that have tried to claim that they are the 144,000. The Jehovah's Witnesses started out initially proposing that they were the 144,000 
until they had more than 144,000 followers. So then they had to change their theology, which isn't hard when you're writing your own, but they had to change their theology to simply say that anyone who was after the 144,000 wouldn't actually make it into heaven, per content to dwell on the new sort of renewed earth for all of eternity. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, historical Mormonism, other cults, right, including some well-meaning Christians, have all taught that the 144,000 are simply something symbolic of the church, that the church now is the new Israel. And of course, one problem with that is that we've seen that the church isn't even any longer on the earth at this point in history. And I think the bigger question is why in the world would any of these groups be fighting over wanting to be the 144,000 when during the tribulation time, this entire planet is going to be falling apart around them. And the reason is this, is that in so doing, right, in claiming that the 144,000 is something other than the Jews, Satan has very conveniently tried to write the Jews out of prophecy and out of God's plans for the future. Right? Throughout history, again, cult members, even some Christians alike, have attempted to take Israel out of the prophetic equation. You have doctrines which you may have heard of, like replacement theology or reconstructionism or the kingdom now doctrines. And they all claim that God's promises to Israel were somehow passed on to the church instead because the Jews rejected Jesus. And yet what we know from the scriptures is that God will continue to be faithful, to remember his promises to Israel. There will come a time once again when he will deal with them because his promises to his people are always based on his faithfulness, right? not on theirs. God is not through with the Jews because the promises that he made to them and the, the covenant that he made with them, it was unconditional. Those promises can't be forfeited. And people say, you know, but Israel failed. Well, I failed too. And they say, well, you know, Israel was fickle. Well, so are you. They say, well, you know, Israel faltered. And well, so do we all falter. And this is precisely why Paul spends three chapters in the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11. He uses Israel as an example. And basically, if we could summarize, he says, look at Israel. Right? God hasn't turned his back on them and so there's no way he's going to turn his back on you. And for us to say that God would abandon the promises he made to his people, it changes the character of God. It calls it completely into question. And it also puts our standing with him really into question. Because if God would give up on his covenant people because of their failure, then where in the world does that leave me? Quite the contrary. Because as God wraps up his plan for this planet, instead of turning his back on them, what he's really going to do is turn his attention back to them. Yes, because of their continued spiritual blindness, certainly Israel as a whole will be in the tribulation period. But what we're going to see is God start to use Israel again to reveal himself to the world, which was his initial calling for them. And although at this point, most probably don't know from which of the 12 tribes they came, certainly God knows, doesn't he? And so in verses 5 through 8, we read this, talking about the 144,000. He says, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. You see where we're going with this? 
Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So. The 144,000 will be true Jews who are alive on this planet at that time. And I think just so there could be no confusion, right, so that no other group could possibly claim to be this group, God goes to great lengths here, right, over and over in four full verses to make sure that we know that these are Jews. Now, most Bible students believe that the 144 Jews will very likely be one for Christ. They'll have their eyes opened to him through the ministry of the two witnesses, right? Moses and Elijah, who we'll read about in chapter 11 in another one of those parenthetical passages. Moses and Elijah will be the two witnesses who will miraculously preach from the city of Jerusalem during this first part of the tribulation. And so after coming to faith in Jesus, these 144,000 Jews will probably be like God's chosen missionaries, right? They'll be his sealed servants to then carry the gospel message out to all the nations. I love once someone compared them to 144,000 little Apostle Pauls, right? They're saved Jews who are now preaching to the Gentiles as well as to their own people. And in a sense, we can scratch our heads and we can think, well, 144,000 doesn't seem like very many to carry the gospel to the over 3 billion people who are going to be left on the earth at this point. And yet when you think about the multitude that Paul alone won as a result of his ministry, even without an Instagram presence and without a Facebook, you know, even without all the social media and the regular media that we have today, well, now we start to see and imagine just what 144,000 who've been sealed and empowered by the Spirit of God, we start to see what the results could possibly be. In Matthew 24, Jesus had promised us that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then, he says, the end will come. And so we believe that this event is what will finally and fully fulfill this prophecy, because the result of this ministry will be the salvation, as we're going to see next in our text, of a great multitude. Now, I think it's worth, it's worth, it's worth mentioning to note, before we move on, as we look at this list of the 12 tribes, what we notice is that the tribe of Dan seems to be missing. And the half-tribe of Manasseh has taken its place. And of course, the effective result of that is that all of those of the tribe of Dan, who God knows will be alive during, they will not be sealed. They will not be protected, and they will endure all of the suffering of this great tribulation. And of course, as we look back at the scriptures, we see that this actually fits perfectly. Because historically, it was Dan as a tribe who first led the rest of Israel into idolatry. Way back in the book of Judges, chapter 18, remember there was that whole thing where they kidnapped a pagan priest from a man named Micah, and they adopted his idols as their own gods. And the tribe of Dan was the one who did this and then introduced that to the rest of the tribes. God had promised back in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 29 that he was going to blot out the names of those who practiced idolatry, and I believe that's precisely perhaps what we're seeing here. And yet, there's something encouraging in this too, because we do see that Dan is mentioned prophetically in one of the prophecies of Ezekiel in chapter 48. Dan will be the first tribe 
who is going to receive their allotment in the land distribution that will come during the millennium. And of course, that happens after the tribulation. It happens after this sealing. And what I love about this is that the scripture here again reminds us that despite their terrible failures, God will remember his people Israel. And he'll remember it according to his word and his promises to them. And I think that should be such an important encouragement to us because it's in the very same way that despite each and every one of our failings, though we may have to suffer the consequences initially, right? we will go through some times of tribulation that we created for ourselves, but God will be faithful ultimately to all of those precious promises that we have given in Jesus Christ. And maybe there's some of you who are here this morning and you feel like you are still carrying the weight of some specific sin, the, the consequences of a particular failure from your past. And in a purely practical sense, you may be. And yet in a spiritual sense, right, in an eternal sense, in a very real sense, the real reality is that not one of God's promises to you not one of the promises that have come to you as a result of your faith and your trust that you placed in Jesus Christ, not one single one of those promises are not yours, even now while you might be in the midst of your tribulation and your trial. God keeps his promises in spite of and our failure. And he has promised to see you through. He's promised to see you safely into heaven. And he's promised to see you stand in his grace while you're here on earth. How awesome is the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the faithfulness of our God, even when we are not faithful. And I think that's why we can say, right along with Israel. Out of 1 Kings 8, it says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. So this is that first group who's going to be able to stand. We see God turning back to deal with his people Right, sealing and protecting this remnant of special servants against that wrath that's to come. And now we're going to see what we believe is a large part, a result of the ministry of these sealed Jews, and that is this wonderful, saved multitude. Look at verse 9. John says that after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Interesting, isn't it, that the sealed Jewish servants that we saw were numbered but this great multitude, it says, could not be numbered. And so we believe that because this great multitude is mentioned right after the 144,000, that it's probably likely that they, the, the, the multitude here is in some part the fruit of the labors of those 144,000. I think we're going to see that more clearly in just a couple verses. It says there in verse 9, they come from every nation under heaven, right? There's going to be Gentiles and Jews in this group. And again, I think that diversity, it's a small detail, but it's important because, again, it's evidence that the Great Commission will be fulfilled 
before the end, just like Jesus promised. When the scripture says this group will come out of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, that means it will come out of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. And John sees them praising God and the lambs and waving these palm branches. And of course, that reminds us maybe of kind of a similar picture of Palm Sunday, but an even more fitting reference to the palms here takes us scripturally, it takes us historically back to the annual celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths or sometimes called the Feast of the Ingathering, right? Old Testament Leviticus chapter 23. This was the event each year where Israel rejoiced, first of all, at the blessing of the ingathering of the harvest. Right? Also, the, the protection and the preservation of his people by the Lord during the whole time that they were wandering in the wilderness. And what they would do is they would set up these little temporary kind of booth structures that had these palm roofs, and it was to remind them of the way that the Lord had covered them during that time. And here they're wearing these white robes, right? I think that's an indication, it's a celebration that the righteousness that the Lamb provided has now come to them. That's what's covering them now. In Isaiah chapter 61, it says that he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. And as a result, they just sing these praise and, and worship for their salvation and they sing it to the Lamb of God. And this is important to know because we need to understand that the salvation of all people in every age has been and only will ever be through the shed blood of the slain Lamb, Jesus Christ. And specifically, they say that it belongs, their salvation, they say, belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Right? It, all of our salvation comes from Jesus, it comes from no one else. Only the work of Jesus Christ can cleanse and save. It isn't something, our salvation isn't something at all that we achieve, but it's something that God gives to us based only on their grace. I love the way that Spurgeon put this. He said that not one of them became white through his tears of repentance, not one through the shedding of the blood of bulls or of goats, they all wanted a vicarious sacrifice, and for none of them was any sacrifice effectual except the death of Jesus Christ the Lord. They washed their robes nowhere but in the blood of the Lamb. And what an important reminder for each one of us, because there's a lot of people out there trying to wash their robes in a lot of other places and earn their own righteousness. And I think as I was really looking at this song, right, that they sing this week, it occurred to me that I think sometimes as believers here on earth, it is so easy for us to just kind of fall into this place where we just start to take our salvation kind of for granted. But that's not at all the case with this great multitude. Here we see them worshiping God, and because of their true and heartfelt worship, we see the same thing that we've seen before, that it compels all the others there in heaven to join in. It's as though the other created beings hear the worship of the great multitude, they hear the, the worship that they're bringing to God, and all the more clearly, it's an evidence of God's power and his wisdom and his majesty, and then they worship God all the more, because they see the salvation that God has granted to this great multitude even during the time of his judgment, during the time of his wrath, during the time as he was pouring out his judgment, they see that his great mercy is still being extended. Verse 13, it says that then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, well, sir, you know. And so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood 
of the Lamb. And therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. I think this is kind of an interesting, almost a comical exchange, right? When asked, John didn't know who these people were. Which again, we believe is another indication that this couldn't be the church. Since John would have recognized the church, he did recognize them earlier in this book. And so John asks, and then the elder explains, that they were those, it says in verse 14, who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Again, an interesting phrase, because we don't think of blood making things white. And yet the Bible teaches so clearly, doesn't it, that it's that precious blood of Jesus, that's what cleanses us. That's what makes us pure. I love the way Isaiah put it. It says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. John tells us in his first letter that it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Now, probably most people conclude that this group of believers, right, this vast multitude from every tribe and tongue of nation, these are the people that are rescued for God's kingdom during the Great Tribulation, and now we see them there before the throne. Some of them may have been martyred for their faith, but it's likely that many, if not most, are the people who are going to receive Christ during those dark days of the tribulation and then survive to inherit the millennial kingdom on the earth, right? That thousand year reign of Jesus, which we're going to... These people are some of the sheep that we hear about in Matthew 25, the ones that it says are going to be placed there at the right hand of Jesus at that great white throne judgment of chapter 20. And yet what I think is most encouraging in all of this, look what it says in verse 15 again. It says that he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. In heaven, you guys, God will dwell with his people. And this is kind of the ultimate fulfillment, right, of that, that man after God's own heart. King David, his greatest desire in Psalm 27, he says that one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And yet I think that there's, a, there's another really intriguing aspect of this idea of God dwelling amongst them because the language of this verse here in the book of Revelation, it also could be just as accurately translated that he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And of course, it harkens us back to the book of Exodus Remember the way that the Lord covered his people, right, as he led them through the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. He covered them. He pr provided protection to them in that cloud during the day. And I think if we start to put this whole picture together, we saw back in verse 9, the multitude is waving their palm branches, right, just like the Jews wave palm branches during the Feast of the Tabernacles. They do it to celebrate God's protection over them as they went through that time in the wilderness. And now here, these saints, they have endured their own wilderness journey also. They've made it through the tribulation and they have done it also because of the protecting presence, right, sheltered there under the Lord. Think about this group. Think about what they would have had to endure during the tribulation, right? They would have been hungry and thirsty. They would have been victims of all of that scarcity that's going to come, right? They would have refused to receive the mark of the beast, and so they wouldn't have been able to buy or sell anything. They would have refused to worship the beast, and so they would have been incurring the wrath of all of the rulers. Of course, they would have had to endure all of those other terrible physical judgments of the tribulation, but even in spite of all of that, because they were sheltered by the presence of the Lord, 
they will live to survive that awful time of testing. And now finally here in heaven, finally we're going to see that they will now know that loving care and that nurturing of their Savior. It says in verse 16 that they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So he'll protect them from every affliction as he also personally provides for their every need. These people will have known affliction on earth, and yet they triumphed over it. But it wasn't their affliction that saved them, right? It was their relationship, their faith that they placed in Jesus, right? All of the tribulation, all of the trial that they're going to endeal, that was great, but look how great their reward is. He's going to give them blessing and the glory of serving him during the millennium and all through eternity. And it says that their tears, therefore, are going to be wiped away and replaced with this joy of being led by him. And of course, this is such a precious promise, right? It's brought so many saints down throughout the history of the church. It's brought them through unspeakable hardship, this promise that in heaven, we who are redeemed will know no more pain or sorrow or suffering. The fact that all of the hurt and all of the struggle of this temporal, earthly life are now gone for all of eternity. And tears and sorrow are absolutely a thing of the past because God has wiped them away. And we think of that image, right, of a parent's loving hand as we you know, brush away the tears from a child's face. And I think that as his children, we need to know that God loves us with just that kind of nurturing care. Because as parents, right, what parent wants to see their child in tears? What parent doesn't want to wipe away every tear to make things better? But also, what parent doesn't also understand that oftentimes even those tears have a real purpose? Because I think that with this precious promise that comes with this verse, there's also an important reminder that comes right along with it, and that is that the tears that we cry on earth, right, all of those tears will only finally be wiped away in heaven. Right? On the earth, we are going to continue to have our share of pain and tears that we have to continue to endure and that we need to continually bring to God so that he can shepherd us through them. Right, right now, he shows his love and his care for us with this sweet consolation that he provides and the strength that he provides, right? showing us that his grace is sufficient. But one day... One day when we get to heaven, not now, but one day he'll finally wipe those tears away forever. So, back to our big question of the day, right? Who can stand during the great tribulation? Only the sealed Jews and the saved multitude. Only they will be able to stand up under the judgment of the tribulation. And it's only for the same reason. It's because of their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. And so right now you're saying, okay, well, that's really neat, Bill. It's great. But what does that have to do with us? Right? And here's what I'd say to you this morning. It has everything to do with us because the very same thing is true for us. And here's what I mean is that those are shown here, right, this saved multitude. They're able to stand, right, under the, the judgment and stand under... They are a perfect picture of us as Christians and the way that we should be relating to Jesus even here and now. See, again, here's what Spurgeon says. He says, the true Christian life, when we live near to God, is just the rough draft of the life of full communion above. 
we have seen the artist make with his pencil or with his charcoal a bare outline of his picture. It is nothing more, but still one could guess what the finished picture will be from the sketch before you. And remember, we touched on it just a bit last time, but it's so important because it's only because of where we stand now, right? It's only because we stand in the grace of Jesus that we're able to stand under the tribulation and the difficulty that we know we can expect in our life. But the point is that our experience today, right here and right now, is no difference than what this group will finally experience in heaven. And that's that we are living in the very presence of God, and we live under the shelter of God. As Christians today, we experience it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Right, that third person of the Trinity, right? We enjoyed peace with God when he saved us. It says in Titus that according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's like as the Holy Spirit brought life to our fallen spirits, right, cleansed our minds, we started now to think the way that God thinks, and we started to see things the way that God sees things. We became the possession of God when he sealed us just like he's going to seal these servants. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says that having believed, you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And this sealing happens the instant that we as sinners trust in Jesus. It assures us as believers of that eternal life, that inheritance that's waiting for us in heaven. It says in the book of Romans, Paul writes that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Peace with God when he saved us. We became the possession of God when he sealed us. And we are also protected by God as he shepherds us even now. I love Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says that it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. As we seek after him for his will for our lives, as we seek to be in communion with him, we will find that he is absolutely directing our path. And I think what we see here is that for this group of these tribulation saints, the Lamb of God is finally able in heaven to be to them what he longed to be for them all during their time on earth because the Lamb is also the shepherd, isn't he? He's the good shepherd. He's our good shepherd. And doesn't Jesus shepherd us even now? Isn't he close to us? Isn't he caring for the, us in this same way right here and right now during this journey on earth? Psalm 23, of course, we're all familiar with it. And unfortunately, we're familiar with it typically because it's usually reserved for what? For funerals. But Psalm 23 is not actually a psalm for death. Psalm 23 is actually a psalm of life. Because perhaps nowhere else in the scriptures do we get a more accurate description. It's not just a description of a future season with the Lord. It's a description of what should be our daily experience with the Lord. Of course, in Psalm 23, it says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if we want to enjoy the peace and to enjoy the assurance and to enjoy the direction that are ours as children of God, we need to stay close to the shepherd. Right? We need to stay dependent on the shepherd. We need to depend on him to lead us to those still waters where we can be refreshed by him. We need to be dependent that he will rest us in those green pastures where we can be restored by him. We need to trust that he will guide us through those valleys as the shadows, right, as we stay there safely close to him. And I think that the real lesson for us today from chapter 7 both as we look at the, the sealed Jews and as we look at the saved multitude, is that the Lord will provide for us, even right now, the very same thing that we see them enjoying in heaven. And why would we ever want to wait until we get there? We will have trial, and yet he'll shelter us in the midst of it. We will continue to have tears, and yet He'll console us. He'll strengthen us. We will all very likely lose our way, and yet we know that he'll lead us as he restores us because he is our good shepherd. And it's only in him and it's only in his grace that we're going to continue to be able to stand. Amen? Let's pray. So, Father... We thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And we thank you for uh, just this wonderful reminder that you provide to us, Lord, that we don't need to wait for heaven, Lord, to enjoy your presence. We don't need to wait until we get there, really, to start to experience the kind of intimacy, Lord, that you desire to have with each one of us. So, Father, we pray that you would direct our hearts even toward heaven right now, Lord, and that we would uh, just be encouraged and our spirits would be quickened, um, shepherding relationship that you desire to have with us. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>